today we're beginning our walkthrough analysis of Beyond Good and Evil. We're going to go section by section. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, before we get into the text, which we're going to start with a preface, which is, in my opinion, perhaps the best preface that Nietzsche ever wrote, I want to talk a little bit about the background of this work and where it fits in in context with the broader philosophical project of Nietzsche. So Kaufman, in his translator's introduction, cites a letter that Nietzsche wrote to Jacob Burkhardt, and Nietzsche writes to him, quote, Please read this book, although it says the same things as my Zarathustra, but differently, very differently, end quote. Kaufman uses Kierkegaard's term of indirect communication, pointing out that thus spoke Zarathustra, while it is Nietzsche's most famous book, is a literary work, it's full of symbolism, it's full of metaphor and poetry, and if you're already familiar with the rest of Nietzsche's work, Zarathustra can sort of open its doors to you, but if you don't uh, know Nietzsche's ideas very thoroughly, Zarathustra can be very opaque to a lot of early readers, and Nietzsche writes Beyond Good and Evil more or less for this purpose. And accordingly, Kaufman uh, sort of describes Beyond Good and Evil as Nietzsche's first attempt to give a presentation of his entire philosophy. Now, I'm not exactly sure that this is true, because I think this is also seen in Human All Too Human. It's just that many of Nietzsche's ideas, the most recognizable ideas of his uh, later work, are not quite there yet in Human All Too Human, and it's seen as sort of a preliminary step, including by Nietzsche himself, right? And as Kaufman points out, um, his publisher up to this point, uh, Ernst Schmeitzner, I believe his, his name is pronounced, had done a terrible job of promoting, marketing, or even selling any of Nietzsche's books. Uh, he complains in another letter that, you know, for 10 years, no copies have been di distributed to bookstores, and that his writings beginning with Human All Too Human are now anecdota. Uh, they're basically, you know, <laughs> now uh, have faded into obscurity after never having really been given the light of day. And he says of Zarathustra, only 60 to 70 copies had been sold at the time. Similarly, with uh, Beyond Good and Evil, he did not have very good results. Nietzsche essentially self-publishes Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, he says that he's going to have 300 copies, or he's going to have the, the book printed up at his expense, and if he sells 300 copies, he'll be able to uh, recoup the cost that he would spend to get this work self-published, but unfortunately only 114 copies are ever sold. Um, and so, in a way, Beyond Good and Evil uh, is perhaps Nietzsche's most successful book up to that point, but that bar is so low, and he's such an obscure writer that um, things seem rather hopeless for him, and after this, he says, quote, I may no longer afford the luxury of print. And so, you know, towards the end of his life, when he writes Twilight of Idols, which is often presented as sort of the final restatement of Nietzsche's philosophy, summed up in one text, and a very short one at that, I believe it generally comes out to like 100 pages or something um, that length, Twilight of Idols, um, on the other hand, I think in comparison to Beyond Good and Evil, is a much inferior presentation of Nietzsche's entire philosophy. And my reason for saying that is that uh, Twilight of Idols, while it contains so many great gems, uh, is kind of disjointed. And, um, you know, he begins with a section of miscellaneous maxims. So it's just sort of his aphoristic style of giving these sort of one-sentence observations. And then he sort of goes from topic to topic without any real overarching plan for the entire text. Um, it's sort of like various snapshots of sort of like the problem of Socrates and, um, you know, he gets into his pro criticism of causality and um, things of that nature. Beyond Good and Evil, on the other hand, has a very nice flow to it. It takes the time to develop and introduce these ideas for an audience that could be assumed to have no prior knowledge of anything Nietzsche wrote, and it does so in a way that doesn't um, fall into the more literary, symbolical style of Thus Books Zarathustra. It's an attempt at presenting Nietzsche's, what was often called his mature philosophy, um, in totality. And so I think Kaufman is right that while it may not be the first presentation of Nietzsche's whole philosophy, it's the only attempt at doing so that includes all of the major ideas 
that we are all familiar with, the big ideas of Nietzsche. I would say it's the best example of a total statement of his philosophy. It's not like the sort of provisional attempt in Human All to Human, and it's not the more, um, what would we say, the ambitious but ultimately a bit flawed uh, final work of uh, Twilight of the Idols, even though I'm sure some people will disagree with me on that. Now, what is Nietzsche's task in Beyond Good and Evil? Well, he begins with this um, question of the truth. The truth is not only the topic of the preface, in some sense, the will to truth and the search for the truth is the underlying theme of the opening section, and then Nietzsche builds on this with the following um, chapters until uh, eventually it sort of takes us through his critique of morality, of religion, of, uh, you know, the political life to some extent, art to some extent, and um, covers all these different domains of his thought. But it all sort of flows out of this initial questioning of the value of the search for truth. That is the definite starting point in this text. And Kaufman points out in his introduction, there's a number of passages throughout the book that point to what the title means, Beyond Good and Evil. But from the very beginning, we already get an inkling of it in that Nietzsche is breaking down what he calls the fundamental faith of all metaphysicians, which is this belief in opposite values. And what exactly is meant by rejecting opposite values will become clear as we move on. But this statement, beyond good and evil, is itself a rejection of opposite values, of an opposed essence of the good against the evil, something which is entirely of the opposite essence, which has an, a mutually exclusive character and which have, um, you know, they're antithetical to each other and they bear no relationship. This is sort of the moral dualist conception that we all have. And in essence, <laughs> which is kind of ironic term to use in essence, but what Nietzsche's project is, so to speak, is to stand for what we might call the immoralist position against the moralists in seeing good and evil as mutually interdependent, as gradations of one another, evil as something that can give rise to the good, and vice versa, of their, of vice versa, of, excuse me, of there being no mutually opposed essence to either one of these things. And this is an immoral thing to see the virtue in error, or in evil, or in things that do us harm, or seem to be opposed to ourselves and our way of life, to see the ways in which that which appears to be an opposite is in fact nothing of the kind, that it is simply our vantage point or our perspective that would lead us to divide things into opposites. And that in fact, what is implied when we posit this faith in opposite values is a divided or dualistic world, a world in which there is um, something good and something evil from which opposite phenomena would sort of spring into being rather than the world as Nietzsche sees it, which is we might call a natural or a phenomenal world, a strictly phenomenal world, um, in which the phenomena that arise don't have a mutually opposed essence. If there are differences between them, this is due to the processes of nature, natural selection and evolution, or whatever the case may be. That, as he says in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, man was not given good and evil from on high, he fashioned it for himself, or man fashioned it for themselves, and often fashioned it in opposition to the good and evil of his neighbor as a way of distinguishing themselves from one another. And, um, you know, that which he called good, his neighbor called evil, and vice versa. But uh, all of the stories that uh, we've told ourselves since time immemorial that, you know, well, we, we are the good because we receive our law, our moral law, from on high, from something divine and beyond this world, and they're evil because they are, you know, either, uh, you know, you can look at etymologically how the term demon comes from the Greek daemon, which was a Christian way of making the Greek, one of the Greek names for their spirits, 
which were divine, into something evil, or how devil comes from deva, um, in that the Persians, who were enemies of the Indians, uh, construed the Indian devas into something evil. And uh, meanwhile, we see the term asra in Hinduism to refer to wrathful, uh, you know, dangerous, sort of like angry deities. Not quite devils, maybe in the Christian sense, but uh, nothing positive either, right? Well, that likely derives from Ahura, as in Ahura Mazda, who was the Persian deity, who was their um, deity who they considered good, right? So we have this pattern of regarding what uh, we think is good and our valuations as being given to us from a divine being. We look at the divine beings of other groups and say, no, those are actually evil beings, <laughs> Um, or we separate the world into the spirit and the flesh, the good that has been ordained by God, and the world of the flesh, which is uh, the domain of the devil, right? And, you know, very medieval Christian metaphysics, which has survived to even this day. And how the statement beyond good and evil, therefore, isn't just simply a rejection, a statement of moral nihilism or rejection of moral realism. It's not limited to the narrow category of morality. It, in fact, applies to the entire sense in which we make these opposite valuations. Uh, basically, the fundamental critique of the book being that these opposite valuations are a sort of fundamental metaphysical mistake that we make. And that this mistake in metaphysics and the way that we think about the world and the operation of the world colors our entire moral view or rather our moral view is one manifestation of that. And it's perhaps the one that might be most important to us because um, morality concerns the very our very way of life, right? How we act, what we approve of, disapprove of, what goals we seek for in the world. So this is actually very important if our entire moral thinking has been skewed by this fundamental mistake. That's how I would put the basic thesis of Beyond Good and Evil. And so with that, um, without further ado, let's get into the text and begin with the preface. Quote, Supposing truth is a woman, what then? Are there not grounds for the suspicion that all philosophers, insofar as they were dogmatists, have been very inexpert about women? That the gruesome seriousness, the clumsy obtrusiveness with which they have usually approached truth so far, have been awkward and very improper methods for winning a woman's heart? What is certain is that she has not allowed herself to be won, and today every kind of dogmatism is left standing dispirited and discouraged, if it is left standing at all, for there are scoffers who claim that it has fallen, that all dogmatism lies in the ground, even more, that all dogmatism is dying. Speaking seriously, there are good reasons why all philosophical dogmatizing, however solemn and de definitive its airs used to be, may nevertheless have been no more than a noble childishness and tyrannism. And perhaps the time is at hand when it will be comprehended again and again how little used to be sufficient to furnish the cornerstone for such sublime and unconditional philosophers' edifices as the dogmatists have built so far. Any old popular superstition from time immemorial, like the soul superstition, which, in the form of the subject and ego superstition, has not yet even ceased to do mischief. Some play on words, perhaps, a seduction by grammar, or an audacious generalization of very narrow, very personal, very human, all too human facts. End quote. So I, we went through the first two paragraphs there because I think it's very important to look at the flow of that whole passage in context. So where does Nietzsche begin? Supposing truth is a woman, what then? And immediately what he says, insofar as they were dogmatists, all philosophers have been very inexpert about women. So it is a completely different metaphor for truth than the way truth has ordinarily been conceived of. What Notice what language Nietzsche is using here. Truth is something that we would desire. Right, So he's taking truth away from the dispassionate world of, for example, the easy target being Immanuel Kant, that Kant believes our reasoning has to be disinterested in order for it to actually be reasoning. You know, for us to be following the rules of logic, um, we would have to only be coming to those conclusions which logic, cold, detached, dispassionate logic dictates – 
um, otherwise, if we're following our own interests and motivations, um, that's not, you know, that, that would impugn our search for the truth. It would be, would mean we're acting less than reasonably. Nietzsche immediately begins by reconceptualizing truth in this anthropomorphic form as the object of his desire, because, you know, he's a straight man, so it's, it's a woman. And by pointing out how the dogmatists, people like Immanuel Kant, people who have, you know, and I would classify Kant as a dogmatist because he has this universalist morality based on this um, metaphysics that he believes has, um, you know, initiated this Copernican revolution in human knowledge and human thought in which we are able to actually salvage something for human knowledge in the wake of the, you know, uh, religious presuppositions of old Europe that were vanishing in the face of the scientific enlightenment. Kant, uh, in some sense, tries to reconstruct some, claw back some of those things that we would lose um, from those old metaphysical certainties through reason. Um, and so that's based on the old Socratic myth, the old Socratic dogma of truth as universal, reason as binding on all men, and reason as this thing which is opposed to the passions. So we already have an opposite essence, right? You can notice these all throughout our thought, reason versus the passions. Um, and so Nietzsche, by choosing this metaphor, is intermixing reason and the passions by making truth something that we desire. And this is it's critically important because it's key to Nietzsche's critique of truth-seeking, that truth-seeking is perhaps the least disinterested thing in the world, rather than, as Kant would have it, as like the most disinterested um, you know, pastime that one could engage in. And Nietzsche is pointing out that um, the entire pursuit of philosophy is something which is motivated and which is not being undertaken by some neutral, um, you know, robotic drone, uh, you know, that we are human beings and that we actually, um, we, we don't engage in unmotivated reasoning. That just isn't a thing. That the very act of, of saying, I value the truth, of I seek the truth, I prioritize the truth, is to make a value judgment, to elevate the truth, to being of the highest value. And that you can't get to that place in and of itself through a strictly rational analysis. And we're going to get into why again as we get into the text, but one of the things Nietzsche points out very early on um, that suppose falsehood was more conducive to life than truth. Would we still say that it is an unmitigated good then to pursue the truth? What if pursuing the truth was harmful and uh, you know, getting seduced by an illusion was actually better for life? What then? Right? And no matter how you answer that question, it's a dilemma, right? Either way, you get gored by one of the horns. Dilemma means two horns. The left horn being if you say, well, then pursuing the truth is not so valuable in light of that, then you've just made truth and the pursuit of it subordinate to human well being, which, you know, you're opening up a whole can of worms there. Or you say, yes, we should pursue the truth in spite of the fact that it harms human well-being, in which case we might question from just a strictly Darwinian or survival-oriented standpoint as to whether the pursuit of truth is even rational at that point. And that, in truth, what, what is actually motivating the individuals who are philosophers or scientists, the people who would consider themselves truth-seekers, is not you know, this disinterested task of truth-seeking, because again, that isn't what human beings are. We're not rational beings, strictly speaking. We have to have some motivation that there is a desire there and there is a value judgment there. There is something irrational there that is driving this pursuit of rationality and reason. And it's because of this that the dogmatists who don't understand this fundamental irrationality at the base of our rational truth-seeking drive have been clumsy, why they have shown that they're, these are clumsy means of winning a woman's heart. By creating this metaphor, by anthropomorphizing the truth, uh, Nietzsche shows us the truth as, you know, this object of our desire, as, you know, some someone we would want to form a relationship with, uh, 
someone that we might have a, I mean, there's definitely, it's, you can't get away from the romantic undertones of this, that, you know, philosophers are, are passionate. They're romancing the truth, right? They're lovers of wisdom, that it is a love and love is not itself rational. And accordingly, he says, all dogmatism is left standing dispirited and discouraged. What does that mean? Well, we just went over sort of in Nietzsche's section of notes, the history of European nihilism, that he sees the 19th century, his own period, as this gloomy but more honest period where everything has turned from, what would you say, the elevation of human reason and this faith in the human faculty of reason and the sort of romantic uh, sentimentality of uh, the 18th century. The 19th century has turned towards a more cynical view of human nature, seeing as people like Darwin unmask our origin as natural beings um, and sort of uh, piece together the fact that we emerged out of this process of natural selection and finding that we are animals. It is an animalian sense, uh, century, right? We increasingly find human beings are the product of biological laws, physical laws, chemical processes, that we are governed by impulses and instincts and these unconscious desires. This is where we're starting to get to, uh, with, along with Nietzsche is largely responsible for this, the birth of psychoanalysis and the understanding of the unconscious and the id, and that our motivations are not these conscious, rationally directed things, but uh, our motivations spring from the unconscious. And so dogmatism in the face of this the old um, metaphysical superstitions that people dogmatically believed in, the universalism of Kant and Socrates and Plato is standing dispirited and discouraged, um, if it is left standing at all. But Nietzsche says, he makes this claim, you know, he says there's scoffers who claim that dogmatism has fallen, that all dogmatism lies in the ground. But then in the next sentence, he says, speaking seriously. There are good reasons why all philosophical dogmatizing, however solemn and definitive its heirs may be, may nevertheless have been no more than a noble childishness and tyrannism. So was he not speaking seriously before? Well, perhaps that last sentence is meant to be a bit tongue-in-cheek. That, well, there are even some people who say that all dogmatism is dead or dying. But uh, I think Nietzsche is gently prodding us to see that that is not a serious statement that dogmatism is alive and well. It's not that he <laughs> has a positive view of it. He says, um, you know, it, it, was, it sort of puts on these airs of being solemn and certain and definitive, but it's actually quite childish. And, you know, tyrannism, uh, the meaning of tyrannism is to say, suggest that it was a novice, it was amateur, right? Um, these were amateur-ish attempts at win winning a woman's heart, at winning over the truth to our side. Um, you know, that, you know, it's like perceiving all of these dogmatists as, you know, the suitor who goes after the girl who presents himself as, you know, all grown up and super mature, but actually he's, you know, still living with his parents and all of that. Or, you know, when it, like you borrowed your older brother's car to take the girl out on the date so you can act like you're older and experienced. But, you know, in reality, um, you're still just, uh, you're still just a kid, right? And, that is the image that Nietzsche is giving us of all these uh, philosophical suitors going after the truth up to this point. And uh, towards the end of this, you know, paragraph, he brings up how, how little was sufficient to furnish the cornerstone for all these unconditional philosophers edifices. The example he gives is the soul superstition. Um, and he says in the form of the subject and ego superstition, it has not even yet ceased to do mischief. So right there, he's pointing out why he says, okay, to speak seriously, I was being a bit silly when I was saying, oh, well, there are people who say that all dogmatism is dead, because that is a form of dogmatism that exists in Nietzsche's time. The ego superstition, which is sort of this, or the, the soul superstition, which is transformed into the ego superstition, which is based on, he says in the form, form of the subject and ego superstition, and what he means by that is the separation of subject from deed, the separation of the doer from the deed, rather than seeing people as Nietzsche does, this is part and parcel with his rejection of the splitting of the world into the true essence of the world and then the world as it merely appears. In some sense, for Nietzsche, we simply are 
what we do. We simply are all that we appear to be. And uh, that he, in some sense, rejects this uh, differentiation, this, uh, that we, it's an, an illusion or a trick that we've played on ourselves. To say that there is this doer who is separate from the deed as our way of, that's like our rational, conscious observer of all of our actions. He thinks that our actions that flow directly out of our impulses, our drives, right? That is who and what we are. And we have this rational witness or observer, this narrator that is crafting the self, this identity uh, alongside it. And that this, the idea that this is actually a separate being from the body which commits these acts, which is something that may have, have sprung out of the psychological need that someone might have. Like, like, say you're a criminal, right? And you think to yourself, well, that's not really who I am. I'm really a good person. I'm really a true Christian. You know, I love my mother and I love my dog. And, you know, um, that's not me. You know, there's, I'm just a good person who happens to have done some bad things, right? So that's the separation that we make. And Nietzsche takes issue with it in some sense. And I, I won't elaborate on that further at this juncture, but we'll return to that detail as we move on in the text. But the important thing here is that he thinks this creation of the unitary, uh, voluntarily governing ego consciousness as the self is itself yet another dualism, yet another splitting of the world, the unwillingness to acknowledge necessity, the unwillingness to acknowledge that what we are is these impulsive beings, these driven beings, these natural animalian beings, and in the same way that we don't look at, you know, a tiger and uh, judge it for its crimes if it gobbles somebody up, we just say, well, that's just a tiger doing what it does. Similarly, uh, if we were to enter a more mature phase of human thought, we would perceive the same thing about human beings and stop making ourselves these special beings who have moral agency. That in some sense, again, Nietzsche's problem with this whole conception of who and what we are that we still hold on to and still have a dogmatism about is that it is inherited from the metaphysics of Christianity, that the ego su uh, superstition comes out of the soul superstition. And so that's why we're the only special case in the animal kingdom that we make and that we're the only being that we make moral judgments on, even though we all know that all we are is animals that came out of nature. Um, you know, and that we don't make these moral judgments on, you know, predators or parasites or any other natural phenomenon, because we still think that mankind is special, even if we've rejected the Christian superstitions about mankind and the soul and all of these things. It's just sort of transformed or transmuted into the ego consciousness superstition that we're special and different. And that is still predicated on the splitting of the world and this opposite value, right? Man is different because he has a soul or... Man is different because we're the only being with moral agency, however we want to put it. And Nietzsche puts, or the way he puts it toward the end of this paragraph, is that this may be some play on words or seduction by grammar, an audacious generalization of very narrow, very personal, very human, all too human facts. So even, you know, it could be a generalization. This is what he calls the congenital defect of all philosophers. And he brings this up first in the book, Human, All Too Human. And so this is, he makes a direct call back to human all to human by employing the same diction here at the end of this paragraph, which I think establishes very early on in the text, the sort of thematic link between these two books, that Beyond Good and Evil is a, um, a more mature attempt at tackling the same project as human all to human. It covers many of the same themes, and he is building here off of the established ideas he had in that work of the congenital defect of all philosophers. What philosophers do is they take what is near to them, what they see in their perspective from their particular time and place and cultural background, and make it into a universal truth. Make it the cornerstone of some dogmatic philosophy, right? Whereas Nietzsche points out, uh, this may just simply be an overgeneralization of some more specific personal fact. Or it may even be something that is universal, but only to all of humankind. That it's something that we are sort of destined to believe as human beings. Like one such thing might be morality and valuing, that man might be the valuing creature, and that there's no way of getting away from morality and having to 
have a morality and a moral conception in order to act and live in the world. It's simply that Nietzsche believes that all of our philosophical approaches to understanding this or to, um, you know, in some sense, uh, answer the questions of morality that have uh, existed since time immemorial uh, for all people universally have been these dogmatic, immature, inexpert attempts. And uh, that very oftentimes what's happening, for example, with the subject and deed distinction that we make is that it's a seduction by grammar, that we make the distinction between the doer and the deed in our language, that the, the language makes this distinction and therefore we think it's like an objective fact of the world. But in fact, that's just an accident of the way that we think because our thinking is delimited by the uh, linguistic conceptual network that we create. But what Nietzsche goes on to say is very interesting and it ties in with what I described as sort of the central task of the book, which is to stand for the immoralists, the people who do not see a opposed essence to the world, this faith and they don't have this faith in opposite values. And they see, as Nietzsche quotes Voltaire saying uh, in his dedication to uh, human all too human, that error has its merits too, right? Or that even things that we consider wicked or evil might have their merits. They might be a preliminary step to something better or something of value. And this even applies to the dogmatists, to the very misunderstanding of good and evil or of the truth and, you know, truth and falsehood as being, that's another false opposition. Or we might say, you know, this, this conception of the disinterested purely rational truth as opposed to, you know, human passion or motivation, things that might obscure the truth from you. Nietzsche, in breaking that down, right, is attacking the dogmatism of seeking for a universal, detached, dispassionate truth. But even that dogmatism, that error, has its merits too. So what does he say about this? Well, let's move on to the next part of the preface. Quote, the dogmatist's philosophy was, let us hope, only a promise across millennia, as astrology was in still earlier times when perhaps more work, money, acuteness, and patience were lavished in its service than for any real science so far. To astrology and its supraterrestrial claims, we owe the grand style of architecture in Asia and Egypt. It seems that all great things first have to bestride... Uh, the earth in monstrous and frightening masks in order to inscribe themselves in the hearts of humanity with eternal demands. Dogmatic philosophy was such a mask. For example, the Vedanta doctrine in Asia and Platonism in Europe. End quote. So, the dogmatist philosophy was, let us hope, only a promise. It's a promise of something in the future. Across millennia, right? So, that you could literally have thousands of years of error in our thinking. And Nietzsche doesn't look at this with the attitude of like lamenting this fact and saying, oh, how stupid we were, but saying, okay, let's look at how this was a prerequisite or something that was perhaps the crucible of something greater, of a promise for the future. And what is, I mean, the example he uses, he says that to astrology and to super terrestrial claims, we owe the grand style of architecture in Asia and Egypt. So in Egypt, obviously, speaking of the great pyramids, and uh, he might be speaking of like pagodas and uh, stupas, things like that nature in Asia, that, and we could just look at the vast number of projects that have been undertaken, grand, grand projects where so much manpower was expended for the purposes of a transcendental goal, either concerns with the world beyond of the afterlife, which was one theory about what the pyramids were, but another theory is that the pyramids were sort of like astronomical or, or uh, astrological observatories, or they had astrological significance. Either way, uh, something su superstitious and irrational uh, was the basis for the creation of some of these great enduring relics of human culture and civilization that we have even today. 
that these incredibly old artifices that we celebrate as like the treasures of humanity, these things that we've produced that have lasted, and they stand as this testament to human willpower and ingenuity. And, um, you know, that Nietzsche is simply pointing out it was an error that we have to thank for the Great Pyramids of Giza. And, and so that's the explanation for his line that all great things have to bestride the earth in monstrous and frightening masks. And he points out, you know, he makes the analogy from astrology to Vedanta in Asia and Platonism in Europe. And so these are, what are they? They're dogmatic philosophies or dogmatic religious claims in the sense that they also have this universal bias and claims of there being a sort of spiritual essence. You could make, I, I think it gets a little hairy with the Vedanta doctrine. Remember that Nietzsche is mostly responding to Schopenhauer here, and that's probably the majority of where his understanding of Vedanta comes from, is more or less in line with, you know, the way Nietzsche would consider the Vedanta would be more or less as Schopenhauer laid out in his philosophy. The idea being that we are all manifestations of the Brahman, that uh, life as we live it, as you know, presented by Schopenhauer, is just this endless chasing of desire that brings no satiety, and uh, you know, by letting go of the, you know, uh, the karma that is generated by uh, your actions and letting go of the your worldly desires, you may gain some identification with the primordial will that's at the heart of the universe, which is of which you are an expression. Or we might look to Platonism, the other example. Platonism is, in many ways, Nietzsche thinks the, he sees it as like, I don't want to call it an original sin, right? Uh, because he fundamentally doesn't regard it as sin. This is actually maybe very useful that that came to my mind of the difference between Platonism uh, being sort of like the first great error in human thought, right? At least as it, the traditions of thought come down to us through Western civilization. Platonism is the, you know, it's like this grave mistake in the same way you might say like Adam and Eve made a grave mistake in the Garden of Eden. But by calling that an original sin in the sense of like St. Augustine or, you know, the early church fathers and how they conceived of original sin as this like moral stain that brought a curse upon the world. Like, it was a bad thing that <laughs> that happened, right? Uh, there was nothing good about it. It was a defiance of the law of God and plunged man into death and suffering and pain. And that's why we need redemption in the first place, right? It was bad that we sinned and that we go on sinning. Sin is bad in Christianity, right? <laughs> Um, and it's bad in essence. It's not just like provisionally bad or kind of, you know, bad from a certain perspective, but maybe from another perspective, sin could be good or useful somehow. It's like, no, it doesn't matter what the uh, consequences are or what the circumstances are. Sin is bad. It's something that you have to overcome in Christianity. And the original sin of man is this thing that stains us and curses us and is part of our essence and who we are. Um, at least the essence of our flesh, right? We have these, you know, as St. Paul says, you know, his, his will is to do the good, but the evil that is in him, his flesh uh, finds not how to do the good. It is only when he is able to, you know, draw upon the Holy Spirit and, you know, uh, the, the grace of God that he's able to resist or overcome sin. Nietzsche sees things completely differently. So Platonism is not like this original sin that stains everything. It was a, an error, a great error, that set us down this path, this millennia-long path of, what would you say, like a mistaken view of reality in the world. It was a monstrous thing. It was a, something that bestrided the earth in a monstrous mask. But that perhaps this very mistake actually had, uh, could give rise to a good outcome. It could be, you could, in the totality of the world, be grateful to that mistake and say that error had its merits, that Platonism, in the same way that astrology gave us the motivation to create these wonderful artifices of culture, uh, 
look at all of the fruits of what this conception of Platonism did for mankind. And so what was that? I guess I was I sort of skipped over explaining what Nietzsche is talking about here. It's the conception of the good as this essential form. The good is the most fundamental form for Plato. And it is literally conceived as something that is detached from the physical world. In fact, in Plato's allegory of the cave, the physical world is rendered illusory. The only thing that is true or of value is the good or the truth, you know, the, the seeking of the good and thus, uh, you know, the pursuit of reason and knowledge and virtue as means of seeking the good, the pers to pursue the truth in order to do the good is sort of the Socratic uh, MO, according to Nietzsche. And this reconception of what the good is, is something totally unearthly and totally in the realm of the abstract and the intellect and the forms. And thus something that, as we discussed earlier with all religions, descended from the lap of being, as it were. Something uh, that is objective or absolute or divine or universal. That is That sort of moral claim is essential to Platonism. And just like with astrology, it gave us many good things. And so immediately after that, Nietzsche highlights this difference between himself and the view of, you know, the immoralist versus the moralist, right? The view of Nietzsche, who is grateful to error, and to the moralist who says, no, that was sin, it was bad, unequivocally. So Nietzsche writes, quote, let us not be ungrateful to it. Although it must certainly be conceded that the worst, most durable, and most dangerous of all errors so far was a dogmatist error, namely Plato's invention of the pure spirit and the good as such. But now that it is overcome, now that Europe is breathing freely again after this nightmare and can at least enjoy a healthier sleep, we whose task is wakefulness itself are the heirs of all that strength which has been fostered by the fight against this error. To be sure, it meant standing truth on her head and denying perspective, the basic condition of all life, when one spoke of spirit and the good as Plato did. Indeed, a physician, as a physician, excuse me, one might ask, quote, how could the most beautiful growth of antiquity, Plato, contract such a disease? Did the wicked Socrates corrupt him after all? Could Socrates have been a corrupter of youth after all? And did he deserve his hemlock? End quote. So that last line is one of my favorites because it's such a it's such a radical attack on Socrates to not only disagree with and criticize Socrates, but to say maybe the Athenians were right to execute him. Because if Plato, who is, you know, this jewel of antiquity, this philosopher who was so prolific and made such a huge impact and is, you know, really an amazing contribution to world literature and yet his whole work throughout it can't be it can't be separated from his work is this dogmatist era of the pure spirit and the good as such again pure spirit as in spirit completely detached from the material the splitting of the world and the good as this abstract thing that is as he says it's standing truth on her head it's complete inversion uh, making, what does he say? He, denying perspective, the basic condition of all life. What does that mean? There, there is no immaculate perceiver or immaculate perception. We might call it no absolute perceiver, in you know those sense that God would be an absolute perceiver in the Christian worldview, right? So God knows all. So there are objective truths which can be knowable because it could be cross-referenced with what God knows. You take that away, all you have are a series of perspectives from which, according to who and what you are, and where you are in existence, things may look differently than they do from a different perspective. The most basic example being uh, the example Nietzsche uses in Genealogy of Morality, that um, you know, the little lambs would consider great, the great birds of prey that carry them off to be evil. Naturally, they would. They're the prey species, so they'll see the predator as evil. Whereas the great birds of prey might say, oh, well, we don't uh, consider little lambs bad. We, we think they're good. There's nothing as good and tasty as a delicious little lamb, right? So I like this example because it shows how uh, 
when we're talking about perspective, it's not literally about perception of the world, although that's certainly included, right? I mean, you might know scientifically that the world is actually made up of elementary particles, but when you walk around, you don't see elementary particles. Does that mean they're not real? No, but your entire perception of reality uh, doesn't operate according to you know perceiving the billions or trillions of particles that are all around you. Um, what you see and what is relevant to you and uh, what it, you know shapes your not only your metaphysical but your moral reality, so to speak, is according to the level of perspective or the, the place, the vantage point that you're at in the world, what kind of being you are, the scale at which you exist, and then you know sort of where you are in the grand scheme of things. And so this is not just simply a matter of perception, although that is included, but it's also like our moral perception that you know if lions and gazelles could moralize, Right? The lions would say that it's morally right and good for them to gobble up the gazelles, and the gazelles would say that it's morally wrong to do so. And naturally they would because of what they are. And there's no well, absolute judge to intercede and say, no, you're right, and this other um, you know, form of life or pattern of life is wrong. It's simply each form of being asserting itself against all the others. And to deny that perspective is to turn truth on its head because to Nietzsche that, I mean, in some sense, that is the fundamental dogmatist error to universalize, to make, uh, to take what is specific to one's perspective and expand it to be a universal perspective. And so for, for Plato to have fallen victim to this critical error, Perhaps the Athenians were correct that he must have been corrupted by Socrates. How could such a brilliant man um, did Socrates then? It was the, if that w w was the case, that would mean the charges that the Athenians leveled against Socrates were right, that he was corrupting the youth, that he was, um, you know, seducing Plato with this dogmatist error. And that error would then corrupt the minds of Europe for millennia. So did he deserve his hemlock? And I, I think we have to take this, you know, tongue in cheek. It's not, uh, this shouldn't be like a super solemn, serious charge against Socrates. Um, you know, the, the events in question played out like 2,500 years ago. So, you know, we don't need to get, um, you know, all worked up about it. And I don't think Nietzsche is either. I think he's being rather playful here with the solemn seriousness and dignity that philosophers have always attributed to Socrates himself and to the death of Socrates. And um, so I think that's very interesting. And so another line I want to zero in on here, that this nightmare is over. What is the nightmare he's talking about? Platonism. Why is Platonism over? The gloomy, honest 19th century and the unmasking of mankind as a natural being, as an animalian being, right? But he's saying, so now Europe can enjoy a healthier sleep. Well, what does that mean? It means these dogmatic assumptions, these superstitions... Um, these still underlie our thought in the same way of the soul superstition transitioning to the ego superstition. It's just that we sort of like laundered them and tried to, we, we always look away, right? When we're about to unmask these fundamental dogmatic errors because of how terrifying the consequences of that would be, we always look away from it. And that's yet another very interesting human tendency that points to something that need. By pointing to that, Nietzsche is also telling us something. That again, our pursuit of the truth is something interested, something motivated, something passionate. That we don't actually want to know the harsh truths in many respects, or, mo or many people do not. The Most people who have called themselves philosophers and undertaken this task have fallen victim in some way or another to a me metaphysical or moral superstition in order to avoid looking at it. Uh, in order to avoid looking at the ways in which our dogmatic assumptions are incorrect because of what that might mean. And so to continue, uh, Nietzsche speaks of this tension of the fight against Plato. So we might say that's the, the coming into being of this more, you know, like on the heels of the Neo-Kantians and the, you know, Darwinians and this, this whole new 
approach to science and to seeing mankind as a natural being, right? This tension between the immoralists and the moralists, the people like Nietzsche who are willing to see the merit and error and the people who want to see good and evil or truth and falsehood as completely opposite categories. That's a great tension that has now been introduced in the European spirit over the course of the past number of centuries. So continuing with the passage, Nietzsche says, quote, but the fight against Plato, or to speak more clearly and for the people, the fight against the Christian ecclesiastical pressure of millennia, for Christianity is Platonism for the people, has created in Europe a magnificent tension of the spirit, the like of which had never yet existed on earth. With so tense a bow, we can now shoot for the most distant goals. To be sure, European man experiences this tension as need and distress. Twice already attempts have been made in the grand style to unbend the bow. Once by means of Jesuitism, the second time by means of the democratic enlightenment, which, with the aid of freedom of the press and newspaper reading, might indeed bring it about that the spirit would no longer experience self so easily as a need. The Germans have invented gunpowder. All due respect for that, but then they made up for that. They invented the printing press, end quote. So this attempts to unbend the bow. So this great tension of the spirit has been produced. So that is one of the benefits of Platonism bestriding the earth in this monstrous mask, um, this belief in the good and the pure spirit, this dogmatic view of reality has created the situation now through this um, tension that we feel as the truths of the phenomenal world increasingly are revealed to us and increasingly are at tension with this essentialist universalizing view of the, the world, this moralistic view of the world. This tension he compares to like a bow being drawn taut. So Nietzsche is talking about drawing taut the bow of the soul, the, the conflict, the inner conflict within the, the hearts of you know, European man up to this point created by this, you know, knowledge of ourselves as natural beings, as evolved beings, as beings which are a work in progress, that's been brought into tension with all of these ideas about the specialness of mankind and, you know, the universal basis of, you know, we, we might say human reasoning as an evolved thing, this is very important, something that was not given to us. We didn't receive the word from on high. So even our, our reasoning could be something which we might not be able to trust to actually discern the truths, the objective truths of the world. We might simply be discerning truths from our specific perspective, but never actually, it might bear no relationship to whatever a quote unquote objective world might be. And this tension we experience it as a need and a distress, he says, and it's because of this that we've desired to unbend the bow. And, you know, by the the modern democratic enlightenment is one of the ways, um, because, you know, with the aid, uh, what does he say, with the aid of freedom of the press and newspaper reading, might indeed bring it about that the spirit would no longer experience itself so easily as a need. Um, you know, in some sense, it's like uh, Nietzsche just thinks... It's, it's sort of just a, a boilerplate criticism of modern culture of being superficial and making everything, you know, uh, shallow and cheap and momentary. That's the big thing, why he's tearing into newspaper reading here. Nietzsche is famously anti-newspaper because he thinks there's something that uh, cheapens your life or is like a, a waste or a squandering of your potential by turning your attention to momentary of current affairs and keeping abreast of all the current affairs constantly. Um, he believes more in being untimely and turning our attention towards affairs, you know, the, the moral questions which have existed since time immemorial. Um, but, you know, the, I think it's actually more instructive to look at the example of Jesuitism, what he's saying here with this passage. And Jesuitism, like what he's criticizing, what Nietzsche's or saying is an attempt to unbend the bow, this inner tension, was that this was like an intellectual development in the Catholic Church. Um, it's also known as casuistry or um, 
you know, it's this Jesuit idea that um, sin could be contextual, that according to the time and place and circumstance, um, you know, that we, we should sort of reinterpret the biblical morality in light of time and place and circumstance and say, well, maybe technically speaking, Leviticus says you shouldn't do that, but given, you know, the needs that were pressing the person at this time and, you know, the demands of his station or whatever it might be, it's basically like a rationalization for how the ends could justify the means. That's the most direct way of putting it, that the Jesuit philosophy toward uh, sin and toward morality and especially as regarded their own actions, right? Um, because the church was a political entity. We can't forget that. So the priests and the entire bureaucratic administrative structure of the Catholic Church was this geopolitical monster in old Europe that uh, you know everyone had to deal with. Even if the church wasn't always successful, you know, you occasionally had people like Henry VIII who were able to break away from the church or people who rivaled the power of the church, like the Holy Roman Empire at a, a certain point was uh, standing in, you know, contrast to the power or in challenge to the power of the Catholic Church. But that being said, everyone had to deal with the church. Everyone had to um, you take them into account, right? They were this ubiquitous political force throughout Europe. And so one of the ways that you could reconcile the tension of occasionally engaging in behavior that might be from one perspective, immoral is that your goal, that that's simply a means to an end for a goal that was ultimately holy and in line with the goals, the moral goals and the standards of the Catholic Church, right? The ends justify the means. Um, I'm sure there's, it's actually a much deeper issue than that. And, um, you know, I'm sure somebody could take issue with the way I'm describing Jesuitism, but this is roughly what Nietzsche means by bringing up Jesuitism as this attempt to unbend the bow of to resolve that tension, to harmonize moralism and immoralism. We'll put it like that, right? This fundamental tension that Nietzsche sees between this, the, the superstitious dogmatic errors that we've received from Platonism, which have been transformed into Christianity, makes it very clear also in this passage, Christianity is Platonism for the people. So Platonism, you know, this idea of the pure spirit and the good as such, the good independent of any human concerns or context or anything like that, and the spirit as sep completely separate from the flesh. During the time of Plato and Socrates, this is like, th the, these kinds of thoughts are like the provenance of, uh, or the province of, uh, you know, the class of philosophers who are mostly all aristocrats. Um, I mean, Socrates himself is not. He's Socrates is of plebeian origin, as Nietzsche never tires of reminding us, but, you know, it, it's a very select few people who are allowed to, you know, spend their time engaging this philosophical speculation. For most people, it's just like the cult of their city or their family or their tribe that they're following. And they have these dogmatic superstitious beliefs that have nothing to do with Platonism. Uh, it's a later development in the Greek world. But Christianity, by adopting these Platonist elements and transforming them into this like religious superstitious, uh, you know, form that the common people can understand into the symbolic and uh, ritualized form, it's able to, it's democratized in some sense. It's Platonism democratized. And so Christianity is Platonism for the people in that sense. And the way that the ego superstition is the soul superstition for the people. It's this transmutation that's taken place, this dogmatism, the slumber that we're still in uh, this dogmatic slumber, right? That's Kant's famous coinage, that Hume roused him from his do dogmatic slumber. Well, Nietzsche is making reference to that here again. But he says, our task is wakefulness itself. And so this unbending of the bow, this attempt to remove this tension undertaken by Jesuitism and the modern democratic enlightenment, uh, Nietzsche thinks are, wh what would you say? Maybe they're mistakes in and of themselves, but uh, more importantly, that would squander the potential of all the tension that we've been saving up, right? It's a good thing to draw taut the bow of the soul. And so we'll finish out the passage. Nietzsche says, quote, But we who are neither Jesuits nor Democrats, nor even German enough, we good Europeans and free, very free spirits, we still feel it. 
the whole need of the spirit and the whole tension of its bow, and perhaps also the arrow, the task, and who knows, the goal. Sils Maria, Upper Engadine, June 1885, end quote. So, and that's roughly when the book is written, is uh, in 1885, summer, and the following winter in 1886. And so that's when Nietzsche writes his preface, is towards the beginning of when he's writing this book, and he's using the metaphor again of the arrow of longing that he brings up in Z Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Right? He says that we should make ourselves into arrows of longing for the overman. The overman being this eternal ideal of for mankind to reach for, giving us a new ideal, a new um, image of human perfection that is not a religious one, but which is based on this natural evolving view of mankind, completely worldly ideal for us to reach for. And so I just think it's interesting that it, if you were to say, wonder what goal is Nietzsche speaking of, he's already stated that this book is sort of a restatement of the central ideas in Thus Book Zarathustra. And while he doesn't explicitly say it in this preface, once we then read through this book, by the end of the book, you can get some idea of what it is that he thinks that, you know, a new type of goal, at least the example is given he, that he has for us of a new type of worldly goal that one could reach for if one wanted to. That's one way that we could spend this great tension of the spirit that we've built up. And so with all of these themes in mind, uh, we'll now move on to the first couple sections of part one, where this thorny issue of the will to truth or the pursuit of truth is taken up once again at the very beginning of this section. And so in part one or section one of part one, chapter one, and just a, a word on <laughs> terminology here. So Kaufman has the text divided into parts. It's nine divisions of the text, nine parts. I will try to refer to these as chapters because I think that makes the most sense. That's kind of what they are. They're chapters. Um, and then, you know, there are then the numbered sections, which some people will call aphorisms. It's not exactly true in all cases. Nietzsche does sometimes write in aphorisms, but some of these sections are like paragraphs long, so it's not really an aphorism at that point, right? So some people will just call all of these numbered sections aphorisms. I'm going to try and refer to them as sections or parts. But so if you hear me say chapter, that's the major nine divisions of the text. If you hear me say part or section, I'm going to be talking about one of the numbered sections. And I might occasionally slip up and say aphorism because I... So used to people referring to the division or the sections of the text that way uh, among Nietzscheans. But, um, you know, if I say that, I just mean one of the numbered sections of text. So chapter one, section one, quote, the will to truth, which will still tempt us to many a venture, that famous truthfulness of which all philosophers so far have spoken with respect. What questions has this will to truth not laid before us? What strange, wicked, questionable questions? That is a long story even now, and yet it seems as if it had scarcely begun. Is it any wonder that we should finally become suspicious, lose patience, and turn away impatiently? That we should finally learn from this sphinx to ask questions too? Who is it that really puts questions to us here? What in us really wants truth? End quote. What in us really wants truth? It's a very important question. Like, uh, if truth, again is not something which we receive from on high. Nietzsche, in some sense, is asking the same question he was asking during his early essay on truth and lies in the non-moral sense, or in the extra-moral sense. How would it be that a naturally evolved being would ever find itself with a desire for the truth? Why would uh, this desire for the truth arise? Assuming that we're not indeed rational beings, that we're uh, in many ways, irrational beings. Um, and so <laughs> the will to truth, he uses the metaphor of the Sphinx, right? That, uh, you know, we're like, uh, he used the metaphor of the woman that we're pursuing in the first, uh, in the preface in order to bring out this idea of the search for truth as passionate. Um, here he recontextualizes that metaphor, the will to truth. Well, so, so the woman was truth itself. Now the will to truth is sort of like the Sphinx, this enigmatic, um, you know, sort of impulse within us to question, to ask questions, to um, 
inquire about these riddles and that now we are inquiring about the very nature of the will to truth. So we're interrogating the Sphinx rather than the Sphinx interrogating us, which is what happens in all the Greek stories. You know, the character goes and the Sphinx asks them a series of questions, which are riddles that they have to sort of solve. And now we're asking a riddle of the Sphinx, of the, the impulse within us to seek after the truth and asking, well, he poses the question in this next uh, little chunk of the text. Nietzsche says, quote, Indeed, we came to a long halt at the question about the cause of this will until we finally came to a more complete stop before a still more basic question. We asked about the value of this will. Suppose we want truth. Why not rather untruth and uncertainty, even ignorance? The problem of the value of truth came before us, or was it we who came before the problem? Who of us is Oedipus here? Who is the Sphinx? It is a rendezvous, it seems, of questions and question marks. End quote. So, and I, I've talked a little bit about these issues. I've quoted from these passages before, but um, the episode that we did on the value of truth or on truth seeking might be rather helpful here. That in some sense, the very act, of, if we make seeking the truth the highest value and we pursue that to its ultimate conclusions what is the result the result is that we must eventually ask if we are questioning everything and inquiring about everything and taking nothing for granted taking nothing as a certainty truly following as descartes did the methodology of doubt making everything dubitable so that we can find the things of which we can be certain well then we have to ask what is the value of this very process Right? It's, it eats itself. It consumes itself. The process of truth-seeking inquires about the value of the process of truth-seeking. And so this is why he says, well, did we come before the problem or did the problem come before us? Well, in some sense, it was a necessary eventuality or inevitability of this very will to truth, of this very process of truth-seeking that we would inquire about the value of seeking the truth. And this is part and parcel with the question of, why not rather untruth? Why not uncertainty? Why not ignorance? Why is it that we would elevate truth as this highest value? If indeed, again, just as a thought experiment or as an, an, as an example, if falsehood could be more beneficial for human life. We might think of, uh, maybe this is like a trite example to use, but the idea of the experience machine, right? This idea of putting yourself into a simulation which is completely pleasurable you basically live in this world of complete hallucinated experience which uh would be a more pleasant existence from the one that we actually live in and you know you just have all your needs met you're just on like a food iv drip and none of it's real it's all just appearance but uh you get to live like a completely happy pleasant content safe life right you're safe in your experience machine that might be an example where untruth, a completely false experience of reality, might be beneficial. Now, Nietzsche would say, of course, the experience machine would not be beneficial to life because, you know, uh, what we, uh, you know, what we actually need is like struggle and strife and so on and so forth. Let's put that out of our minds for right now. I mean, he would he would say that like you know that's like a utilitarian conception of what would be beneficial to life, which is not actually true. So. Um, you know, I, I feel the need to point that out, but um, I'm simply drawing upon it as a convenient example of something in which you might have an appearance which is completely false, but which produces pleasurable results, right? So if, assuming that pleasure is the thing that we're all seeking or happiness is or contentment is the things that we're all seeking, um, why would you be dissatisfied? And that is, I think it's Nozick who puts that idea forward and his assessment is that most people would not be happy with the experience machine. We would all say, but it's not real, right? And Nietzsche is pointing out, what is it about that idea, but it's not real? Why is that a motivating argument? Why is that something that holds weight? What, why, why this will to truth? Why this will for only what is real and not the will not to be deceived? Where does that come from? Why would we have evolved such a thing? And we, more importantly, have to ask this question if we're serious about the will to truth at all. 
If we're serious about seeking the truth, we have to question the value of seeking the truth. And that doesn't mean to say that we should dismiss the value of seeking the truth because we might say, but I honestly feel that it has to be real. I want my life. I, I do want to pursue the truth, right? Nietzsche is asking us to interrogate that very idea within ourselves and why we have that feeling and that desire. So to finish out the section, he says, quote, and though it scarcely seems credible, it finally almost seems to us as if the problem had never even been put so far, as if we were the first to see it, fix it with our eyes and risk it, for it does involve a risk and perhaps there is none that is greater, end quote. Bit cryptic, you might say, but I think we can all see, if we think about it for a few seconds, <laughs> what the risk is. Because the risk in bringing the truth or truth-seeking, the activity of philosophizing, of science, of expanding our knowledge and trying to get closer to this enigmatic truth, the risk of exposing that to questioning, suppose we do find that uh, tr truth is not valuable or is not more valuable than mere appearance, or that there's no objective basis. There's no rational basis for saying that truth is better than mere appearance. And if that is what we find, then we have to get gored by that other horn, as we mentioned at the B or earlier in this talk, in this analysis, that we have to come to the conclusion that our rational truth-seeking drive is itself irrational, which means that uh, there's like an inherent contradiction there. Okay, let's move on to the next. And so that's why Nietzsche says, perhaps the problem had never been put so far. And I think he's perhaps correct about that. Um, maybe it would be with Kierkegaard. I think many people would say that Kierkegaard has a similar approach, but that Nietzsche is the one who first brings this problem into stark relief, which he calls the problem of science. Um, and so section two, and he begins this section, when we start reading, it. there is quotation marks around this whole first paragraph. It's, well, Kaufman breaks it into a first paragraph. And then Nietzsche basically says, after this whole first blurb that we give, that this is the prejudice of metaphysicians of all ages. So he begins with this sort of like, he's speaking with the voice of how he perceives how the metaphysicians of all ages re read dogmatists, moralists of the past, people have been very inexpert about truth. This is how they conceive of things. So we'll start with uh, section two. Quote, how could anything originate out of its opposite? For example, truth out of error, or the will to truth out of the will to deception, or selfless deeds out of selfishness, or the pure and sunlight gaze of the sage out of lust. Such origins are impossible. Whoever dreams of them is a fool. Indeed, worse, the things of the highest value must have another peculiar origin. They cannot be derived from this transitory, seductive, deceptive, paltry world, from this turmoil of delusion and lust, rather from the lap of being, the intransitory, the hidden God, the thing in itself. There must be their basis and nowhere else. End quote. This way of judging constitutes the typical prejudgment and prejudice which give away the metaphysicians of all ages. This kind of valuation looms in the background of all their logical procedures. It is on account of this faith that they trouble themselves about knowledge, about something that is finally baptized solemnly as the truth. The fundamental faith of the metaphysicians is the faith in opposite values. It has not even occurred to the most cautious among them that one might have a doubt right here at the threshold where it was surely most necessary, even if they vowed to themselves, de omnibus dubitandum, end quote. So I inserted an end quote there because it was the end of Nietzsche giving the view of the metaphysicians of all ages. But so we have it right there. I you know, explained a lot of this section, which is very important, the section, second section for explaining sort of the central thrust of this first section upon which the entire work is based, that the fundamental faith of the metaphysicians is the faith in opposite values. And what we have at the end there, de omnibus dubitandum, that means all is to be doubted. That is Descartes' methodology of doubt. It's a direct quote of Descartes. And, uh, you know, in the Latin and so right there, he says, we should have raised a doubt right at the threshold. 
right at the outset of doubting everything, we should have doubted the very task of doubting everything. Now, that, and that's sort of the reasons for that are all of the concerns Nietzsche brought up in the previous section. Let's examine a lot of the things that he, he puts in the mouth of this, this uh, you know, you could call it a straw man, but, you know, he's, he's, he's not really trying to, like, caricature somebody's, a specific argument of a specific person. He's psychologizing, right? He's saying this is the kind of attitude that has underlain dogmatic philosophy. And, you know, there's, there's something that's very interesting about this. So, we might look at, I'll just, I'll skip to the middle of the text where he says, the sunlight gauge of the sage out of lust. And I want to bring this out because I think this is <clears throat> something that in Nietzsche's study of one of his heroes and his psychological assessment of one of his heroes, like revealed something to Nietzsche. And so it's when he talks about Schopenhauer, and I don't, I can't call to mind exactly where he writes this, but that Schopenhauer, he, he had this like hatred of women which Nietzsche is often accused of himself, but Nietzsche even <laughs> shows you how much how much of a misogynist Schopenhauer was of Nietzsche's calling him out for it, where he basically says that Schopenhauer made women his enemy, right? They were the, the representative of, of the devil for Schopenhauer because his problem was that he had a lifelong battle with his own sexual impulses and that he felt this, this pull, this lust, this sexuality in him his entire life that uh, he was always dealing, you know, even when he was an old man, he had the passions of a young man, right? And he was always at war with his own passions. He always, he was so stubborn and willful. He didn't want to be dragged in one direction or another by his passions. And that this sort of is Nietzsche's psychological assessment of Schopenhauer and his way of explaining Schopenhauer's entire project of negating the will, right? That's what Schopenhauer's whole philosophy is premised on, is the idea that we're all these willing beings and it's this desiring, this willing, this chasing after our desires, which keeps us shackled to the world of samsara. It's very Buddhist in that way, very Vedantist in that way. And that Schopenhauer, therefore, uh, comes to this idea of like becoming a willless subject of knowing. So still being consciously reflective, still being a, a being of consciousness and knowledge, but one who has like evacuated the will from himself who has be, is able to become absorbed in like sublime contemplation through aesthetics, through meditation or whatever the case may be, and therefore no longer is dragged along by his passions and his desires. And so Nietzsche basically says, well, this is, this is a guy who uh, feels at war with his own desires, who doesn't like um, being dragged around by his sexual impulse, and so he makes war on it, and then his entire philosophical explanation of the world, his entire metaphysics, this entirety of world of, as will and representation is just the confession of this, this lustful philosopher who, because of that lust, ends up promoting this idea, advocating for the way of life of the sage, of the ascetic, of the, the religious, um, you know, the saint or the priest, the person who uh, renounces the world renounces the things of the world, the desires of the world. Um, these, as Nietzsche says, this transitory, seductive, deceptive, paltry world, this turmoil of delusion and lust. The sage, the ascetic, the saint, this is the person who successfully rejects those things. So of course, that's who Schopenhauer makes into his ideal, because he's a man that is just riven with lust and passion. You could take or leave that interpretation, but that's how you get the pure and sunlight gaze of the sage out of lust. And so then when he says selfless deeds out of selfishness, well, this is uh, perhaps, again, old hat <laughs> at this point, because I think these kinds of uh, insights or considerations have been um, somewhat mainstreamed in recent years. But there's the idea that there's no truly selfless deed. Every deed is selfish, at least to some degree, because you could say like... Uh, that every motivation that a human being acts on, as we've pointed out, is in some degree motivated by their own self-interest. So that even if a deed that apparently has no, you know, um, what, what, what might we say, monetary or material reward for carrying it out, like giving to charity or something, the person is still who gives to charity might still be, they're still 
doing it out of the motivation of conceiving of themselves as a good person. So in the past, you know, like the selling of indulgences or in the East, you know, donating to the Buddhist temple in order to, uh, you know, resolve your own bad karma. Doing good deeds makes us feel good is another way of putting it, either because we've absorbed a cultural superstition about it. But I, it, see, the, the religious superstition, we shouldn't see that as the cause. That's just simply a manifestation of the fact that the collective is always imposing its morality upon the individuals in the collective. And that's what Nietzsche's assessment is, is that our, our sense of guilt or shame or fear at uh, doing something immoral or bad is the voice of the collective in our head in the form of the conscience, um, constantly pushing us one way or the other. And in many cases throughout history, that's been sort of rarefied and transmuted into this whole cosmic drama in which your good or bad actions are in fact always being watched by a moral judge, right? Whether that judge is God or the, you know, karmic necessity, right? And so in some sense, it's always a matter of selfishness or self-preservation because even the selfless moral act is a way of advancing ourselves, of feeling pleasure at our own goodness, of being assured of our own salvation or of our own virtue or whatever it might be. And so I just wanted to look at those examples of the immoralist interpretation of reality. These are all the things that the metaphysicians, the dogmatic uh, metaphysicians of all ages have said, well, that's nonsense, right? The things of the highest value have to have another peculiar origin. They have to have an essence which does not come from this transitory, lustful, you know, uh, world of deception and and uh, delusion and lust, right? That uh, the good things have to have their own essence. We've already covered most of that. So we're, we're going to go back into the passage now. Quote, for one may doubt first whether there are any opposites at all, and secondly, whether these popular valuations and opposite values on which the metaphysicians put their seal are not perhaps merely foreground estimates, only provisional perspectives, perhaps even from some nook, perhaps from below, frog perspectives, as it were, to borrow an expression painters use. End quote. So to break in very quick here, um, foreground es estimates, provisional perspectives, frog perspectives. It, that's an expression painters use. So getting us to think about perspective quite literally, right? Perspective in the sense that a visual artist thinks of perspective. In order to reveal something about perspective in the broader philosophical sense that Nietzsche is using it, of our perception of reality based on who and what we are. The frog perspective is a low perspective. It's the perspective from the ground up. Perhaps it is because we are looking at things from those perspectives that we fail to see the totality that one might see if they were standing, say, on the mountainside looking down at the entire scene. You know, looking from the perspective of a frog within the forest what do you see? What is your reality like? What is your moral reality like? Versus somebody who's looking at the forest from a mountain 6,000 feet above it. What do they see? What is the forest? How does it appear to them? It's quite obvious, perhaps, but the idea of not being able to see the forest for the trees. So um, <laughs> that metaphor, he's, Nietzsche is bringing into question, if all is to be doubted, First, we may doubt whether there are any opposites at all. And second, whether these popular valuations and opposite values are not merely frog perspectives. That this very perception of opposites is not seeing the forest for the trees. Not seeing the fact that something like the sunlight gaze of the sage, something good, this, you know, this, the sages are, you know, or the saint, as Nietzsche talks about, the, these holy men, of all ages are, you know, there are these bastions of love for all mankind and people who live simply in humility and take vows of poverty and are like the anchor of their community or seen as these like, you know, uh, moral role models, right? That this moral role model may have been born of their own immoral impulses. It might actually owe to the fact that they have they feel their immoral impulses more strongly than the average person. That's why they become a moral bastion of the community. Um, and so 
that's the way in which if you're approaching the world through this dogmatic universalism of the essence of the good and the pure spirit and so on and so forth, you will not see the forest for the trees. You will not perceive that about the sage, that within him, the entire story of your faith and opposite values of, of why it breaks down is sort of made, revealed to Nietzsche here. So we'll go back to the text, quote, For all the value that the true, the truthful, the selfless may deserve, it would still be possible that a higher and more fundamental value for life might have to be ascribed to deception, selfishness, and lust. It might even be possible that what constitutes the value of these good and revered things is precisely that they are insidiously related, tied to, and involved with these wicked, seemingly opposite things. Maybe even one with them in essence. Maybe. But who has the will to concern himself with such dangerous maybes? For that, one really has to wait for the advent of a new species of philosophers, such as have somehow another and converse taste and propensity from those we have known so far. Philosophers of the dangerous maybe in every sense. And in all seriousness, I see such new philosophers coming up. End quote. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, it, Nietzsche, I mean, come, I think this is all felt fairly self-explanatory given the, the prefacing that I have done throughout and explaining what Nietzsche is talking about here. But uh, we have this, uh, this first inkling of the philosophers of the future and the main difference between them, that they will not be dogmatists. They will be, uh, that Nietzsche thinks they'll be immoralists in his own vein. They'll be the kind of people who can see the... <laughs> The, the possibility that, you know, selfishness might be of the same essence with selflessness, that selfless actions and selfish actions are two sides of the same coin, or that lust and, you know, sageliness, chastity, ascetic values might be of the same essence, that deception and truth might be of the same essence. And what he means is actually not an essence at all. What he means is they all come out of the same world. They're all part of the phenomenal world. Man fashioned his own good and evil. Man, uh, it all comes, it's all authored out of the minds of beings such as we are, who are these impulse-driven beings. And that, therefore, that is the root and the origin of all that we are and all that we do, all of our moral ideas, and that it is in fact not that we have this divided nature between soul and body or between our moral side or our rational side and our animal side. That all of these awful, seemingly awful things about mankind um, not only flow out of also what makes us good, but they also might be responsible for a lot of what makes us good. And this is a very dangerous maybe. But all of these dogmatists, the ones who have been really inexpert about winning a woman's heart, haven't been willing to live dangerously and raise those questions. So now section three, quote, After having looked long enough between the philosopher's lines and fingers, I say to myself, by far the greater part of conscious thinking must still be included among in instinctive activities, and that even goes for philosophical thinking. We have to relearn here, as one has had to relearn about heredity and what is innate. As the act of birth deserves no consideration in the whole process and procedure of heredity, so being conscious is not in any decisive sense the opposite of what is instinctive. Most of the conscious thinking of a philosopher is secretly guided and forced into certain channels by his instincts. End quote. So once again, beyond good and evil, breaking down this faith in opposite values, we even have a faith in the opposition between the instinctive or what might be derived from our impulses and drives, and what is conscious, what is derived from rational thought. And Nietzsche is pointing out that our, the products of our rational ego consciousness actually are not of the opposite essence. They're not something separate from the instincts or from the body. They're still, all of our thoughts are generated from a mind that is within a body that is still driven by the instincts. And being conscious is not the opposite of what is instinctive then. And this is a very, this is another dangerous maybe to raise because it means 
truth see again, it brings us back to that place where we have to completely reevaluate what truth seeking is. That the philosopher's thought, if it's being guided and forced into certain channels by his instincts, which I think is a wonderful turn of phrase, that means that the philosopher himself is not a rational being, right? He, he's also, his philosophy is an expression of his own irrational needs, or we might say non-rational, uh, anti-rational, extra-rational. Um, these instincts are what is primary and our rational thought is, again, as he talks about in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, a surface and skin. Or uh, that's not in Zarathustra. What he says in Zarathustra is that the, the um, instincts or the drives are the leading string of all the mind's notions. It's simply a reformulation of the idea of the instincts forcing our conscious thought into definite channels. And this might have been quite shocking at the time Nietzsche was writing it, but again, after you know uh, more than a century of psychoanalysis, most people more or less accept this, that we our conscious world of rationalizations is often simply... Um, an elaboration upon what it is that would serve our own interests or that we believe what we want to believe and not even in an arbitrary sort of, you know, willfully ignorant sense, but that in the same way that Schopenhauer's entire philosophy ends up being like this confession of his own uh, character or his own nature, that the way that we see the world again, if we really take perspectivism through to its ultimate conclusions, it will always be a reflection of that, of who and what we are. And then, so immediately after this, in this section, Nietzsche gives us a line that I've never tired of quoting on the show, quote, behind all logic and its seeming sovereignty of movement too, there stand valuations, or more clearly, physiological demands for the preservation of a certain type of life. For example, that the definite should be worth more than the indefinite, and mere appearance worth less than truth. Such estimates might be, in spite of their regulative importance for us, nevertheless mere foreground estimates, certain kind of niaiserie, which may be necessary for the preservation of just such beings as we are, supposing, that is, that not just man is the measure of things." End quote. And uh, Kaufman points out in his notes that Protagoras is the one who initially says that man is the measure of things. So what does Nietzsche mean by that, saying, supposing that not just man is the measure of things? Well, that uh, if we are to buy into this idea of an objective world at all, of this, that there could be truths, that like perspectivism sort of requires this, right? That you have to understand that there could be truths that you don't have access to, or that a being such as yourself simply wouldn't be able to perceive, or that if you could, it would be so unrelated to your reality or your world that you might not even be able to like really comprehend it, or it certainly not wouldn't apply to your life, right? And so it, that that's what he means by saying, not just man is the measure of things. There might be other beings that measure reality in different ways, in the same way we talked about like the value system of the lion versus the gazelle, right? And so if we accept that perspectivism, then we he returns to this uh, this coinage, mere foreground estimates, which he used in the previous section when he was talking about perspective in a very literal sense that painters would use, frog perspectives, perspectives from below, or it's just simply a foreground estimate. So the the very idea of the definite being worth more than the indefinite and mere appearance being worth less than truth may itself be a mere appearance. It may itself be something indefinite. It may itself simply be an irrational preference. And, but to return to that, that line, that very important line. So this ties in with the broader thrust of this section three, that the philosopher's thinking is actually driven by instinct, which forces his thought into definite channels, behind logic, so what's driving our logic, what's pushing it along, it's, it seems to have this sovereignty of movement, it seems to be arbitrary, it seems to be this thing that is universal and binding on all men, right? To which uh, we can adhere. These uh, laws of logic or reasoning. But in fact, it's pushed along by physiological demands, 
for the preservation of a certain type of life. And so it may be that it, it is even universal to all humanity, right? We might find that being such as we are might require that we, what would you say, that man, man as a being that has achieved this level of sapience and consciousness, that thinking might be so indispensable to us, and thus the whole conscious process of truth-seeking might be so indispensable to us, that we are always destined to regard mere appearance as worth less than the truth. So this returns to that question earlier. Why truth? Why not rather untruth? Why do we have this uh, irrational impulse toward truth-seeking in the first place? Well, it might be that <laughs> for an irrational reason, for you know the preservation of beings just such as we are. It might be our own uh, physiological demand for the preservation of a certain way of life. And that way of life is as a um, being which thinks of itself as rational. But the really core point here is the perception of values as themselves not derived from logic, which I think is it's at the center of all of these threads of thought that he's raised in this opening section. That valuing, the process of valuing, cannot be reduced to a rational process, which means the pro the valuing of rationality itself can't be reduced to a rational process. Um, and once you really get that, I'm sure there's a lot of you who already have, that's already clicked with you. And I'm probably belaboring the point too much, but I, I do all of these, especially, you know, the first episode of a new like little series. I, I do all of these with the idea that no, the, somebody re, uh, listening to this might not have read Nietzsche at all. This might be the very first thing that they're getting into Nietzsche with. And so it's very important that this idea of values, um, the fundamental nature of values, pri being prior to logic and all reasoning is motivated, really has to click with you, um, at least in insofar as you can like um, provisionally adopt that viewpoint and understand what that viewpoint is saying, even if you don't agree with it. It really needs to click in order to continue forward with the work. But Nietzsche uh, elaborates a little more on these same ideas in the next section in, in number four, where he says, quote, the falseness of a judgment is for us not necessarily an objection to a judgment. In this respect, our new language may sound strangest. The question is to what extent it is life-promoting, life-preserving, species-preserving, perhaps even species-cultivating. And we are fundamentally inclined to claim that the falsest judgments, which include the synthetic judgments a priori, are the most indispensable for us. And without accepting the fictions of logic, without measuring reality against the purely invented world of the unconditional and self-identical, without a constant falsification of the world by means of numbers, man could not live. That renouncing false judgments would mean renouncing life and a de denial of life. To recognize untruth as a condition of life, that certainly means resisting accustomed value feelings in a dangerous way, and a philosophy that risks this would, by that token alone, place itself beyond good and evil. End quote. So we have another explication of what the title of this work means, of what it means to go beyond good and evil, to recognize untruth as a condition of life. Why is that such a problem? Because again, um, so it's so paradoxical here, it's almost hard to, to hold it together in your brain. But the overall message of this section, of section four, the falsest judgments, which include the synthetic judgments a priori, are the most indispensable for us. Synthetic judgments a priori are one of Kant's, uh, you know, it's the, the, like immediately this conjures Kant. That's who he's referencing here. Um, so he meant judgments that are known for certain to be true, independent of experience, but are not true merely by definition. So there's a lot of things that you could know to be true, independent of experience, simply by definition. Like there's no married bachelors in the world. You don't have to go and, and talk to every bachelor on earth to know that none of them are married because by definition, if you're a bachelor, you're not married. Okay. So that's very easy, but what about a synthetic judgment? Well, synthes synthesis, right? That's bringing two things together. Um, 
like woven together is what I believe synthesis means. So to make a synthetic judgment where you bring, you know, your uh, perception of the world or, or of the evidence, your empirical perception of the world together with your faculty of reason and make a judgment about what is true that you could like Kant believed it was important that, you know, his whole epistemological project sort of rests on the idea that we could have these synthetic judgments a priori. Um, and he asked the question of how are they possible? And, um, we talked about this in the episode on the congenital defect of all philosophers, which is back in season one. A lot of stuff from season one uh, might be useful to refresh yourself on as we go through this text. But so the reason why Nietzsche brings this up, Kant is an example of one of those dogmatists who is bringing in these ideas like synthetic judgments a priori. That's another transmutation of that same dogmatism of um pure knowledge prior to experience right uh and then what else does he uh, he bring up here he says without accepting the fictions of logic without measuring reality against the purely invented world of the unconditional and self-identical without a constant falsification of the world by means of numbers man could not live so these synthetic judgments a priori this knowledge prior to experience that is not known by definition, um, measuring reality against the world of the unconditional and self-identical. This is the world of concepts, right? Uh, again, the falsification of the world by means of numbers. What do numbers do? In Nietzsche's words, they equate unequal things. We just group things together and say, uh, there's five people there. Five people are not equal, right? They're all completely different um, you know, there, there are so many differences between them, but we, we create a category, we create a class or a set that we call people. Well, they're all the same organism, and then we put them, them together and equate them. That's purely something on the, the level of the abstract. That doesn't exist in real life, right? Um, it, it's just a means of classifying things, but the classification itself isn't something that we find in reality. It's a fiction that our consciousness authors in order to make sense of the world and navigate it. That is indispensable to us, is what Nietzsche is saying. It's not true. It's not an objective fact. Uh, the way that we classify different phenomena, I mean, that's, it's, it's, some of this, like you might say is just so, again, so obvious, but it's, it's re really important, right? So the way that we divide up the phenomena in the world, and the way that we classify things, the way that we put organisms or objects or, um, you know, events or people or whatever into the same sets and categories, and then, you know, sort of like draw a boundary around them and exclude everything else from that. Nietzsche is saying that the basis of this is its indispensability for us is the usefulness that we derive in doing that, that it allows us to navigate the world, it allows us to make sense of things in order to achieve our ends or our goals. It's not that we're discovering some truth about the world, that there are some essential properties that certain things have that group them together with other things, because you could, there are an infinite number of ways that you could group things together and endless debates about the boundary lines that you could draw between different types of phenomena or organisms or people or, or what have you. That's why we have like specieses and subspecieses and, you know, on and on and on. Like there are all these like concentric circles of classifications for every type of say biological organism. And that's not like written into the fabric of the universe. Like that's, those are just at a certain point we draw an arbitrary line because we need to be able to make a distinction or else it's not clear that we're talking about anything at all, right? You have to make those distinctions in order to be specific and actually say something. But the line at which you draw the distinction is not something objective. And we could debate endlessly about where the line could be drawn. What Nietzsche is saying, these are all fictions. The, the, the dogmatic, uh, the fictions of the world that have been drawn by dogmatic philosophy are one of these things that are untrue, but have actually served life. 
that by measuring reality against the purely invented world of this conceptual world where there are things that are unconditional and self-identical, right? Without that, uh, being such as we are, man as a thinking being, as a measuring being, would not be able to live. And that's so to return to the beginning of section four, the falseness of a judgment is for us not necessarily an objection to it. He says that that's the way that our new language will sound the strangest, but it all comes back to that same coinage, that error has its merits too. That (laughs) if those false judgments, those dogmatist errors were indispensable for us in order to live, then it's not a mark against them that they were errors because at a certain point, it's like, well, what are we even talking about here, right? You're, you're measuring, you're, you're, you would have to evaluate the dogmatist's errors from the standards of a dogmatist in order to convict them or condemn them for making those errors. You would have to yourself be a dogmatist and say, well, they were wrong. Uh, and that wrong, it, it was that it, untruth was inherently bad. And therefore, it was bad for them to be wrong in this way. But that's completely not the framework. That would just be recapitulating to that same framework. And that's why Nietzsche says he's the first one. This is perhaps the first time where we fixed our eyes on the problem and we can actually transcend that old uh, dogmatic framework for the first time. Um, All right, we're going to do one last section in this read-through today. This is section five, quote, What provokes one to look at all philosophers half suspiciously, half mockingly, is not that one discovers again and again how innocent they are, how often and how easily they make mistakes and go astray, in short, their childishness and childlikeness, but that they are not honest enough in their work. Although they all make a lot of virtuous noise when the problem of truthfulness is touched even remotely, they all pose as if they had discovered and reached their real opinions through the self-development of a cold, pure, divinely unconcerned dialectic, as opposed to the mystics of every rank, who are more honest and doltish, and talk of inspiration. While at bottom it is an assumption, a hunch, indeed a kind of inspiration, most often a desire of the heart that has been filtered and made abstract, that they defend with reasons they have sought after the fact. They are all advocates who resent that name, and for the most part even wily spokesmen for their prejudices which they baptize truths." and very far from having the courage of conscience that admits this, precisely this, to itself, very far from having the good taste of the courage which also lets this be known, whether to warn an enemy or friend, or from exuberance to mock itself, end quote. And so you could make an argument that that's what Nietzsche is doing here. Nietzsche is truth-seeking. He's being a philosopher. He's just saying, I'm the first one who's being honest about what this is, that my truth-seeking is a passion, It's an irrational drive that I'm engaged in. It is truth built on the foundation of untruth. And that's what all of you were doing too. You're no different from the mystic who is more honest and doltish, right? So like a dolt, like an idiot, right? Uh, Like the honest, naive idiot who just says, well, this is all just comes from inspiration. Now, of course, the mystic thinks it comes from like a spiritual domain. Nietzsche is saying the philosopher gets his inspiration too. It just comes from his thought is pushed into definite channels by his instincts and impulses. It's, he is the same as the mystic in that regard because that's actually what's happening with the mystic in Nietzsche's view because he has this purely naturalistic approach to life and philosophy. So, you know, to be honest about what you're doing and to admit, have the courage to let this be known and to admit this to yourself, um, we can see how it fits, it slots right in with Nietzsche's view of, what does he say, from exuberance to mock itself, right? The lighthearted nature of Nietzsche's quest for truth versus we've noticed this sort of like jabs throughout that he's taken at the solemnness and seriousness. This The solemnness and seriousness that all philosophers have had And what does he say? The virtuous noise they make when the truthfulness problem is touched remotely. The great irony is that they're the ones who are being, who are deceiving themselves, who have bought into these dogmatic lies, these these fictions about reality. Um, And yet they're the ones who make all this virtuous noise when the problem of truthfulness is touched remotely. Well, the, the great paradox here is that Nietzsche is being the most truthful of all of them by questioning the value of the will to truth. (laughs) 
He's the, he's the only one who's being honest enough to take that quest through to its logical conclusions. And he's doing so he, out of this sense of exuberance and self-mockery, lightheartedness, killing the spirit of gravity, no longer this solemnity and seriousness. That's how we break out of these old, uh, which, you know, again, is seen as like sort of the side, the other, the other side of that coin, or we might say the compensation, the compensatory uh, projection or appearance that we give off to compensate for childishness, right? Again, it's like uh, I compared it earlier to like the guy borrowing his older brother's car to impress the girl and appear like he's this mature, self-sufficient guy. You know, like we might think of like uh, uh, Nietzsche's coinage that uh, it comes later in this book of the seriousness of a child at play, right? We all have seen like, you know, <laughs> uh, kids who are playing adult who like a, a put on these mock serious tones, maybe not intentionally trying to mock it, right? But that's, that is the mental image that I get from this of like, how childish and childlike the philosophers are, and how Nietzsche therefore looks at them half suspiciously and half mockingly, because of how these airs of seriousness that they put on to their entire quest. And that in some sense, by saying, let's approach this in a more lighthearted way, and not get, you know, super sucked into our own heads about you know, not falling victim to any paradoxes or, or giving any concession to untruth or perspective or all these things that are uh, necessary parts of life. Um, and by that token, Nietzsche is therefore doing, in at least in his view, but also in my own, doing a better job of winning a woman's heart, right? Uh, truth, if truth is a woman, you know, uh, what do women like? You know, be, be funny, be natural. Be, be yourself, right? Don't put on these airs. Don't try to be like dishonest or, or hide or c construct these fictions around what you're doing so that you don't have to like admit that the truth seeking impulse is itself irrational. Be completely upfront about all that and be willing to like mock yourself and be a little self deprecating about it. And that's what Nietzsche is doing in this, this text. This, I consider this first section, which I, I, just realized up to this point, I didn't actually introduce the section title on the prejudices of philosophers is like a philosopher being anti-philosophical in a lot of ways or being critical of philosophy as a means of advancing philosophy. In some sense, it is paradoxical, but in another sense, I think we can all understand how you don't improve something by not criticizing it, by not being honest about, um, you know, maybe the contradictions and so we'll finish out this passage, quote, the equally stiff and decorous tartuffery of the old Kant as he lures us on the dialectical bypaths that lead to his categorical imperative, really lead astray and seduce. The spectacle makes us smile as we are fastidious and find it quite amusing to watch closely the subtle tricks of old moralists and preachers of morals, or consider the hocus pocus of mathematical form with which Spinoza clad his philosophy, really the love of his wisdom to render that word fairly and squarely, and mail and mask, to strike terror at the very outset into the heart of any assailant who should dare to glance at that invincible maiden in Pallas Athena. How much personal timidity and vulnerability this masquerade of a sick hermit betrays, end quote. And Spinoza is someone that Nietzsche has a lot of positive words for. He calls him his precursor, right? But what does he call out in Spinoza? His, the mathematical form that he, Spinoza is this like, uh, sort of like famously impenetrable philosopher. He's one of the more difficult philosophers to read. And Nietzsche is saying, well, what he's doing there is taking, he says philosophy. So love of wisdom. He's saying really it was the love of his wisdom that could apply. It doesn't just apply to Spinoza. That would apply to any philosopher in Nietzsche's view, because it's the love of the wisdom that they have gleaned from their particular perspective that they're then attempting to universalize. And again, as like a sort of compensatory appearance of cladding his wisdom, his palace Athene. So his, his truths, right? Again, by making it the palace Athena, this goddess of wisdom, Nietzsche is making truth a woman once again. And so this is his truths, his woman, and he clads her in mail and mask. He makes her this fierce warrior like the palace Athena because to ward off anyone who would 
attempt to come in and challenge his truths, how much timidity that betrays. So once again, the psychologizing in this passage is just simply brilliant. That old Kant, once again, he leads us on these dialectical bypaths to his category, categorical imperative, right? But really, he's leading us astray and seducing us. He's not actually leading us down a path to a, a morality purely derived from detached, dispassionate logic. He is actually doing the same thing that all philosophers have done, that he is engaged in his own motivated reasoning and attempting to seduce us over to his particular truths. And I mean, it's really as simple as the old adage that, you know, it's like the loudest preachers of their own, you know, religion are the ones who like have the most doubt in their own beliefs. Um, I, I'm sure butchered that. I'm sure there's like a much more succinct or better way of putting that, that adage, but that the most zealous crusaders for their ideology are the ones who have the deepest doubt in it because those are the ones who then feel the need to clad their beliefs in these arguments of, you know, logical impenetrability out of that, that, that that is an expression of their own inner insecurity and that the people who are secure in their beliefs don't need to argue and debate about it at all. They don't need to, you know, write a treatise and why everyone who disagrees with them is a sinner or, or, you know, hopelessly wrong. Um, you know, that the, the proselytizer is, you know, really the deepest doubter. Um, it's funny because as we get into this, it'll be clear in the ways that Nietzsche even understands this further complication, but it's very funny to then apply all of this to Nietzsche himself that the unmasking of what philosophy is and the psychologizing about how all of the philosophy hitherto has you know sprung out of the prejudices and the you know passions and instincts of the philosophers doing the philosophizing that completely applies to Nietzsche and he is more than aware of it and so he does something very dangerous even for himself and the vulnerability that he you know, takes on and what he leaves himself open to by leaving himself open to those same attacks because naturally you think, well, doesn't that apply to you too, Nietzsche? And yes, it does. And as we go on with the text, um, we'll see the fun ways that Nietzsche will even sort of play with that as we go forward. So we've only gotten penetrated through five sections of this first uh, chapter of the text on the prejudices of philosophers, but Particularly the preface is so dense and so, I think, brilliant in so many ways. And the ideas are, I hope I've done a good job of sort of leading you through how what we're thinking of here is almost forbidden by our, our language. What Nietzsche is trying to present here in challenging opposite values, our entire language, in some sense, is premised on opposite values. Because our language exists within this world of fictions of the unconditioned and self-identical. And we have all these words which indicate opposites. And so to say that selfishness and selflessness are of the same essence. In some sense, you're defying the entire rules and logic of our grammar. Which means the entire internal structure of our thought is disrupted by the way Nietzsche is asking us to think here. Which is why you could compare particularly this work of Nietzsche's to um, texts such as the Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, which also contains an extensive um, sort of meditation on opposites and what Nietzsche would call the faith in opposite values and the ways in showing how, you know, the yin derives from the yang and vice versa. And so that's uh, an interesting, perhaps, parallel in Eastern philosophy that one could look into. I don't know, uh, I haven't planned out, you know, I'm certainly not doing, I didn't intend to go chapter by chapter because I think it's going to take more episodes than that. So I don't know exactly how many episodes we're going to do to get through this book, which is kind of exciting because, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, I don't like imposing that artificial sort of need to get through a certain number of sections in an episode and to like 
narrow things down and, you know, because it might be that in one chapter of the text, I need to spend more time giving commentary and in other chapters, it might be fairly self-explanatory and I might be able to give less time. So I like the looseness of it. It's one of the advantages of the podcast format. I don't have anyone saying it has to be this length of time. On the other hand, it's a bit daunting because I have no idea how long it'll take. And uh, I don't want to, you want to move at a reasonable speed. You don't want everything to get bogged down. So I guess I'll just say at the end of this, I don't intend to move this slowly through the entire text, but I think many of the ideas that we're introducing here, you know, it's, it's not for nothing that many people read and reread, especially the beginning of this book and this first book. And it seduces so many people from the very beginning and, and, and draws you in and you find yourself kind of gnawing and chewing on the ice, these ideas for long afterward, because we don't really have the language and he's disrupting our normal patterns of thought to get this information to us. And it has to sort of click with you before you can really move on and, and, you know, go through the rest of the text and really comprehend it to really grok everything that we're doing or that we're going through. So I think it's justified to spend this amount of time in the preface and like these first uh, five. And then when we come in next week, with aphorism number six, it's a rather famous, uh, see, I just called it an aphorism, section number six in chapter one. It's a rather famous section. It's actually the section that Jordan Peterson did like a 45 minute analysis of just this paragraph. So we're going to start with that next time. And, uh, hopefully I'll be able to give a better analysis than Jordan Peterson. That's who I've been gunning for from the beginning, right? <laughs> I'm going to take Nietzsche from it. Uh, all right, so joking aside, thank you everybody for joining me. I hope uh, all of you are as excited as I am to go through this book in detail. And um, another person who I think has done this is Gregory Sadler, although I haven't like I haven't listened to all of his episodes in such granular detail, but I think he he employs a, a greater deal of brevity than I myself use. Uh, this is the more long-winded, more extended discussion because I think. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's merited by this text. So anyway, thank you for joining me, everyone signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.